So we have one last presentation before opening up to the panels. And it is about MEV and propose, proposer builder separation. And we're going to talk about a little bit of neutrality, what's the state of current MEV and block building, yada, yada, yada. So myself, joined by Vincent, one of our colleagues, he couldn't make it, but you know, I'm going to talk about through his slides too. So buckle up. So I want to give you a fair warning. It's not a presentation that we had like earlier, the products. This is a fairly a different one. The reason is it's a more of a research and development that we have took for the last five months for a pressing problem in Ethereum. And we are basically presenting our solution. And it is the V1, as we say. Um, so we, this is a very open approach. It's a community um, disclosure, what is there and what we trying to achieve or trying to solve. Um, there are a lot of intricate things that we're going to go through these slides. Um, so why we are here is we have this kind of new thing after proof of merge, the MEV become more dangerous to the Ethereum existence itself. Why? Because we have very ill-defined supply chain currently. Why this happened? is because we switched from proof of work to proof of stake, and obviously there was unknown unknowns. So there was some issues propped up, and we're trying to do some, some sort of diagnosis on the real root causes of the problems and try to fix that as we go. And in the long term, we believe that will help to get a, a proper solution. Right, so what happened in post-merge, in October, we've shifted from proof of work to proof of stake. Where earlier, if you're not familiar, there's a big mining pools were making the blocks and they were appending the Ethereum blockchain. But after the proof of stake, we got hundreds of proof of stake machines. And the result was like this. A bit about a FDX kind of a thing, like no one was expecting, but it did happen and it just goes really bad. But luckily we are not that bad. It's still ongoing thing. We'll see how it, bad it could be. So just taking a step back. Earlier it was like six people and they're doing it. Nobody knows how uh, it's very opaque. And you know, you MEV guys were just, you know, a bunch of searchers will just negotiate a deal with them behind the scenes and they will send the transactions and they get through it. That's okay. But then most of the mempool will also get through it. But the one catch is there in proof of work, even though you know one of these big guys will actually going to make the blocks, it's still technically a probabilistic. So if you have enough power, you can, you know, brute force it with the hash power and then you can get the blocks in, right? That's a proof of work, how it works. However, proof of stake doesn't really work like that way. In Ethereum proof of stake, you know, when it was completely switched to a lot of BLS keys and it's been assigned to many, many machines, some of them are with the staking pool, some of them are with the DAP nodes, some of them are like, you know, some other, you know, um, enterprises. So you got a lot of lot of people who can sign the block un unlike the, the proof of work. And you don't know who is going to sign because it's a lottery every 6.4 minutes. So that's that's basically brings this problem like still you need to process a transaction. Then every transaction needs to be in the block and the block needs to be appended with the signature of these guys in the proof of stake. All right. So that's basically that it is the problem. So there was um yeah, this is from Danny. Uh, he wrote a, a piece just a few days ago. And that's where we are now with all these things in the last five months. So it's pretty aggravating uh, situation. It's getting really, really out of control. And community need to step in, right? And a lot of people are working on it. So as I said, we are trying to put together a solution from our side. And um, we're going to discuss details into it. 
So if this is getting really getting out of controls, the bad scenario that we're going to see it is like your transaction will not get through because somebody don't want you to process that transaction. That's called censoring, all right? What are the reasons? Okay, so a bit of who we are, why we're doing this, and why it is important to us. Because as we said in the, in the previous sessions, we are long on Ethereum, and we're long on EVM, we're long everything about Ethereum, right? And it's all about roadmaps of Ethereum doing. We, we create public benefit tooling. And the core thesis is we want to give as much as fallback for the end users. And if there is any kind of censoring actors coming in in between, that's trouble for us and the, all the users. And also, you know, there are a lot of things that we have done in MEV side. We are the only staking solution that we consider MEV as a fee, a revenue model that can actually bring equilibrium for the liquid staking derivatives. Uh, two and a half years ago, but that was not the MEV, but just the fees. MEV is like a cream on top, but the cream is too much now. That's a problem. So, we're, since we are trying to solve the problem, we have to take a step back and see, you know, what are the things that's been done, right? So, we try to follow the footsteps of Ethereum Foundation, Robertson in Incentive Group. All these guys have done a lot of lot of work on PBS in the last year and a half, and this is not a new thing. This has been there, and it's been in discussion for a while. But we're going to discuss where things actually went wrong, all right? Uh, so it's a great, but there's a lot of other people, independent people, are doing great effort. So I want to say that all these guys are doing great job. This is a much neater thing. We are community. Right. So... Of course, we cannot do this since it's only like five months. We don't do like five months protocols. We have, we have like a year, year and a half. We are notoriously known for like, you know, putting things and testing for a long time, the formal approach. Uh, obviously, you know, two good friends, runtime verification, they, they always help us. They said, when we talk to them, we want to do it. We are solving a problem. We will, we may, we, be, we may get it. Fine, all right. When you do it, We'll, we'll, we'll get you the code audited. We'll be there, LFG. All right, we go. So Dabnor said, there's another one is like, we need to get the users, solo stickers. Anything that we need to do, we need to get the solo stickers. We need to get the Dabnor like the bedrock of the Ethereum solo stickers. Let's say, let's say. So if we don't have this kind of good friends and good community, we cannot do this kind of things and take on big things like with a, with a good confidence, even though if we can do it, but it's, you already need, always need support. Okay, so. That's, that's all said. I want to say what actually happened from DEFCO in Bogota. And this literally was the situation. We say that, oh, the PBS is broken. We need to fix that. And the discussion room goes in. PBS? What the heck is that? I didn't hear that before. Yes, MEV? MEV is different. PBS is different. Fish is different. So... What is a clear definition of PBS? We need to find out that, right? Because it's a new thing. It's naked in the block, right? Right, fine. So we start looking at it, how things are going, because we have censoring. Everyone says that we need to get out of the censoring problem immediately. So we said, right, censoring is easy to solve. We can get something, a test it. We don't want to show it. That's all right, cool. So how does the PBS is getting done the most of the dominant MEV things were done through MEV boost. And that's the dominant strategy. Remember there's not MEV boost is a different construction. And it's a it's a it's a construction proposed by an independent party. It's good and it's been going on very well. And this is what they've written. It's all good. We're reading it. That's great. Build the blocks. Pick the blocks. Most profitable, it goes to the validator. This is like a really coordination. Great, let's do it. Let's get the software. Let's go and do it. There's a, there's a PBS there. Okay, so there's a PBS. Let's work on it. Boom. Go and check it out. Then you come to realization. It's not a PBS. It's kind of a philosophical BS. All right, we cannot work on that one because we are working on smart contracts. We cannot execute that thing there. 
we need something that actually defined and it's actually there. Because if we want to do something on smart contracts, it needs to be real. So we are kind of a situation that we need to know what really going on. So we looked into it. There's only one thing it says. Miners were replaced with relayers, with a huge database. There is no nothing exist. Great. What do we do? Pack up and go home? We're not ready to do that. We have to do something. So before we getting into what is that something that we're doing now, would it work? Would it not work? We'll find out. But let's say how Ethereum actually works now in proof of stake. What is this the new guy, builder? Where is this coming from? What is the relevance on to that? So the builder is a new entity, is a much neater entity. The proposer uh, is the fancy name for validators. So stakers, call, validators, proposer, all of one. Different names, but in different context, right? So Ethereum validator is a call proposer in this, and you have the execution layer. That's the one that you normally use to process the transactions. That's where you, all the blocks are getting transacted, right? The consensus layer, the guy who came like a two years ago, that's the, the security layer for consensus. And that's a different chain. So Ethereum is two different chains right now. It's not one chain, consensus layer and execution layer. And that's a great architecture. It's an amazing construction. We love it. We are a big fan. That's why we're working on it. Right. So every 12 seconds, there is a slot, which is like a block in the consensus layer, get added. And it just get appended, 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 appended. Who adds this? These are added by the validators. They get picked up in every 6.4 minutes. You know, 32 guys were selected. Lottery, get shuffled, shuffle, shuffle, goes on. So everyone, you will get a fair chance, right? But now the execution layer is the blocks. Now, the, earlier, it was used to be 15, 15 seconds. Now, you follow the consensus layer. Now, you are also in 12 seconds. The way it works in execution layer is like, you follow the consensus layer, so you need a signature from the guy who is actually making the block. It's not, he can make the block, but he need a signature from that. So why the builder is, Ethereum is actually going in a very ambitious roadmap. And we're going to get EIP 4844, we're going to get Dan sharding, we get a lot of things are coming. So the building, block building going to be very sophisticated very complex operations, and we need to have really dedicated entities to come in, right? The validator is like, so we can actually make this operation, and there should be some sort of coordination need to be there. So it is a much neater thing. So builder needs to come in. That's where the proposal builder is coming into place. So that's the context, right? So the block builders will be there, and we need to be more and more block builders come. Good for us. So that's where the block builder and the proposer exist in the system in the first place, right? Cool. So Vitalik wrote about this, how we get more distributed builders, which is much needed thing in the roadmap of Ethereum. So it's kind of an aggregator in between. The builder is an entity, but a lot of aggregation will comes in. So how do we get this kind of a market to exist, which is not there at that time when he wrote it, like the proposer. So that's a really good approach. There's a lot of things written out there. You can go and read it. But in, in short, there's an, there should be a coordination market. That's great. OK, so when you talk about aggregation, it's a coordination problem. That's our area. Yeah, we can work on that. So we got something that we can work on. We're happy now, right? We can solve the problem. So we got three guys, builders, relayers, proposers currently. And there's a private order flow. Put it simple. You send your transaction to a server, and that server is only available to one builder. That's a private order flow. If you send it to a public RPC endpoint, a lot of people can show, then it's a public order flow. Are you getting it, or am I going to nonsensical? <laughs> okay, cool. 
Thank you. So then, then there's searchers. Searchers are the guys who are very rational actors. They watch out for in transactions. They want to. They want to pack the transaction a certain way, and that's privilege order flow. You can preferential order flow, whatever you want to call it. So you have you have a block. You have a bunch of transactions in a block. You go to Etherscan. You will see that. You know, transaction hash, and then it's including the block, you will see a lot of, a list of transactions. But they want, let's say there's a 10 transaction, they was like, I want to have this five transaction exactly in this order. Can you get this in? And I will pay you one ETH. And they tell this to the builder. Because if that is executed exactly like that way, that's how the state transition happens in Ethereum, right? It's sequential. Then they will make some money. Sandwich attack. You name it. This is like this the whole different world. We're not getting into that. We're not getting into maybe bad or good or anything like that. We're strictly focusing on the problem at hand is how to get this builder proposer separation at least in somehow to be there, right? And it should be credibly neutral, not surveilling transactions, not looking at what you're doing as a relayer. You have no place here in proposer builder separation. Doesn't have an R. But you can have a relay. It is a much neater thing because you need to coordinate. Right. So we got the builders. Then we need to have any kind of you know, aggregations. We can get the relayer. We can say that you know, a relayer can have some kind of strategy where they will aggregate from all these kind of builders because independent actors, we can do that. We can give a decentralized builder software for them. What's the reason the other guys on the other end that who have the signature authority to sign it, they will come and join and say the relay will, you know, anything comes from the relay we will sign it. So you need to have a very robust incentive to get all these guys in the room. And that's how the market operates. You know, we get we go to any store and we get milk, we get all these kind of commodities, all these things are being coordinated by some kind of a, you know market scheme fair and open. If it is not fair and open, then you will have different kind of pricing, right? So how are we going to do this with a smart contract and how are we going to control these off-chain actions is called the PBS part and the PON part. I would like to call upon my colleague, uh, Winston. He will just get into the nitty gritty and we are getting into really good stuff, so watch out. Thanks, Matt, for setting the scene. Um, so uh, from our perspective, what we want to do is start talking about what a smart contract based in protocol PBS looks like. And uh, Matt's already defined some of the, um, the actors in the system. Uh, so we have uh, most of them listed on, on, on the slide. Uh, you have your proposer, you have your builder, uh, and, and the relayer is there. Um, and you've got an additional guy, which I will get into in a second. <clears throat> but in our uh, smart contract based um, uh, in protocol PBS, we want to start with on chain representation. So, on chain representation means having a membership registry for each of the actors. Everybody in the system should be known so that you can perform effective coordination and negotiation, right? So we have a builder, and we want to represent them in a smart contract um, with their ECDSA address. So they are going, going to build reputation against that ECDSA address. Now, builders are, there is potentially an infinite number of builders that can arrive on the scene. And just like anyone um, can set up a business. Um, it, it says nothing about whether the business will be a success, but anyone, you know, theoretically has the, the ability to set up a business. And over time, you build up reputation against your business. But there's costs associated with starting up. So in this case, being a builder, you have to put up um, a, a stake bond in the, in, the, in the contract to become a builder. That is your membership for your Costco card. And, um, okay, so we have the builder. Now let's talk about the proposer. So proposers, there are a restricted number of them. Um, 
uh, restricted effectively by the amount of ETH in supply. You take uh, 120 million Ether, roughly speaking, um, not accounting for losses, and you divide that by 32 Ether, you get the maximum number of uh, potential proposers that can e exist um, on, the, on the beacon chain. Um, and um, the beacon chain has a, a, a maximum number of slots that, uh, that uh, are produced every year, um, and uh, that is defined in 12 second intervals. Um, not every proposer will get uh, will produce uh, every slot. It's uh, it's it's a lottery that that takes place every every 6.4 minutes and and chosen by an in protocol um, oracle known as the the Randau for for its uh, shuffling. Okay, so they have a BLS key. That's their identification. Um, we don't care about, for the proposer, we don't care about um, any uh, stake bond required to actually participate in the system, con considering the fact that they have already staked 32 Ether, um, so they have already something at stake, and um, but the one thing that we do care about is a consensus layer metrics. So, most importantly, effective balance. Um, the, um, um, we want, in, 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 in uh, proposer builder separation, we want, Proposers to be online when, when they are called upon by the, the, the Randau. They need to be online, ready to go. Um, and uh, the effective balance is a great way of measuring how well the proposer is performing because actually it's, I wouldn't say like super easy to, to maintain that uh, 32, but actually um, you know, there are a number of things that you have to do in order to get down to um, a, a 31 effective balance. Um, you know, you, you need to leak at least uh, if you're starting with an induction balance of 32 Ether, you need to leak at least 0.25 ETH to get to the point where your effective balance is going to fall. So that means uh, you've not been operational for, um, uh, it, I think when we did a simulation modeling, I think it's a, it's a, it's quite, it's a few weeks. Um, so you're, you're basically not doing your job. Okay. Um, now the relayer, okay, so relayer, um, in the, in the, um, in the uh, supply chain, uh, we have this uh, piece of software uh, that uh, if, you've run, if you've run a node, whether it's on testnet or, or, or not, you know about this MEV boost software. This is the, you know, um, interestingly named, you know, uh, because it's, you know, the idea is to boost your income as a validator. So that's the part in the, in the supply chain that everybody's running. So you're running your consensus layer uh, clients, you're running your execution layer clients, and you know, 96.7% of, um, uh, of all proposers are running uh, and, and proposing boost blocks. So um, that is uh, uh, the, where the, you know, they've signed off on blocks that have come through boost rather than uh, proposing blocks with a, um, uh, that they built locally and not outside. Um, these relayers are currently making, um, uh, well, the, the Boost is interacting with the relayers to, to do this kind of coordination thing. Um, but the relayers are doing, as Matt has alluded to, the relayers is doing much more than relaying. A relayer, you know, by definition, is only supposed to be a messaging, passaging, message passaging, uh, passaging, message passing uh, device. Nothing more, but it's making decisions because these relayers are, 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 are seeing the entire transaction list and they're in a jur jurisdictions whereby they have to be OFAC compliant, for example. So we can complain and you know, uh, be sad about the censorship that happens at the relayer level, but the, the thing is these are operated by entities that operate in the real world, so operate you know, by uh, real world laws, and you know, we all live in the real world, right? We can't escape uh, regulations and, and that sort of thing. Um, but the relayer is doing too much. It doesn't need to do stuff. It just needs to talk between two, uh, uh, pass messages between two parties. So those are the three known actors that we already know about, but we want to introduce this additional guy. So with our in-protocols um, uh, smart contract-based uh, uh, PBS system, um, we have this on-chain representat representation of uh, the, um, the actors in the system, but um, the actors of the system uh, maybe sometimes don't have their, uh, their uh, values aligned, and um, they, they can potentially misbehave. So proposers, for example, may, might not be online when they're supposed to be. Uh, builders don't pay um, what they should pay. Uh, you know, basically people grieving each other. You've got the relay in the middle currently making decisions. And, you know, it's, it's all 100% off-chain at the moment. And it's really hard to follow. It's, 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 you know, it's a bit of a mess, really. So we want to introduce a, a guy or a, an entity that is going to keep the system in check and be paid to keep the system in check. 
much like Uniswap pays arbitrages to keep its inventory in check. It gets the market from outside to manage the inventory and pays them for the job that they do. They're not running oracles. They're not, you know, maintaining the inventory themselves. They don't even get. They don't even uh, know who's supplying the inventory in the first place. But yet, they can build a coordination mechanism um, that can allow the market to self-organize for their own self-interest. So you 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 optimize for people's own self-interest, which in this case, making money. So, let's see what we can do. Um, so what does the software what does the software suite uh, look like? There's some things that you probably expect here. Is going to be a builder software. So the builder is going to assemble transactions um, uh, and, and, and produce uh, eventually a block, uh, an execution layer block. Uh, they are not constructing the uh, consensus layer block, but uh, in an execution block, they're, they're, they're producing a list of transactions that will cause a state transition um, that will alter the global world state of Ethereum from uh, one previous state to the next with the transactions listed. So that's the builder. Um, proposer, okay, so proposer, we're not doing anything special here. Um, this is a, the piece that we're leaving in the MEV supply chain. We're leaving this untouched. MEV boost, proposers are already running it, already talking to relayers, leave that be. Um, that's the, the people that are maintaining boost anyway, they're gonna change it many times. So um, we don't want to go too far and change you know, things that are actually uh, not causing a problem. Boost is not the problem here. That's why we haven't touched it. Um, uh, relayer, so, hmm, it says we started with a Flashbot base, which yes, we did, um, uh, and actually when you neutralize a relayer, which is what we have done here, we've completely neutralized it um, by removing the requirement to see any transactions. So you start with a base, that's really big, requires a lot of storage, requires a lot of data. You remove the requirement to uh, seal the transactions and you're actually, you actually end up with what a, re what a relay I should be. You know, something just to pass messages between uh, two entities. Um, so to be honest with you, there's nothing there anymore in the relay. Um, it's just this go between, you know, between uh, boost and builder which is what it should be. And then the reporter is the, the guy checking all everyone else. That's why we have this three plus one. The reporter is looking at the, the, the relay, the builder, looking at the proposer and seeing who's, who's naughty, who's not. And if you are, right, the hammer will come down. So um, Justin Drake, um, as, as Matt said, the, the, the research has been going on for a, for a while and um, uh, in and outside of the Ethereum Foundation, and this, um, this model was proposed by Justin Drake at the Ethereum Foundation, um, this, um, this dual framework. So you have, the, on one side, um, an encrypted negotiation market. The idea is that you encrypt a list of transactions that should only be decrypted by, hopefully, the proposer. And then the guy in between maybe can, um, cannot see anything because it's encrypted. OK? Um, and. Um, just to give you some context, what is happening in our, in our construction is, well, Boost actually only cares that the, the validator is signing a block header. Um, that's all the validator needs to do in order to allow somebody else to propose a block. So this, this use of the term proposer, it's, we, we continue to use it, but it's not really strictly that they are proposing. Actually, they're more signers at this point. They're saying, yeah, I will sign off that this is the block header that you can go and propose because it's got my signature. I'm the one for a given 12-slot period that has the, 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 the right to extend the chain. So you're, you want to extend um, the consensus chain. And remember, um, the consensus layer chain has to extend one slot every 12 seconds no matter what, no matter if there is an execution layer block or not. So you have this term missed slots. but Missed slots is, is more that the proposer didn't do, uh, didn't add an execution layer block to the, the chain. So you have these, Ethereum is just two chains, right? Slot is, uh, consensus layer is going, 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 and going every 12 seconds, no matter what. And then um, most of the time, execution layer is following along and extending the, the, the chain, and you have this EVM guy um, that is doing state transitions and extending, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's one for one that um, the, uh, the execution layer blocks is including, executing at the same time as uh, consensus. Um, so, um, 
Yes, encrypted negotiation markets from, from Justin Trey. I, I deviated here a bit. Um, now, um, uh, that, that, that's cool, but uh, from, from our perspective, we want to... Okay, so I've introduced, um, in our smart contract uh, system, I've introduced the on-chain rep representation. This is the, the, the notion that everybody in the system is known. The relayers, the reporters, the builders, the proposers, um, they're all known, but, 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 on-chain representation is not enough. So what we need is we need something called a payout pool. Um, yeah, uh, which, I'll, which I'll, 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 go to, I'll go to now and come back to this. Uh, right, the payout pool, yeah. Um, okay, so the payout pool we will come to in a bit, but um, essentially what we wanna try and do with this, this, this dual framework um, is um, we want to prevent things uh, going wrong with, uh, with the proposed builder separation. So uh, we want to prevent um, proposers uh, grieving builders and, and builders, uh, we want to prevent builders uh, grieving proposers. Um, and that's, that's, that's just the basics. So what we do here from a, from an on-chain perspective is we have on-chain settlement. That's what the payout pool is. Um, it's on-chain settlement um, of payment from builder to proposer. And if anything goes wrong in between, we can, we can, actually, we can actually detect that. So it gets really, really interesting. Um, I want to bring Matt on to talk about auctioning. This is a really interesting topic. Auction, auction, auction. All right. This is something that CT is talking a lot. How do we perform auctions? But nobody's talking who the auctions, what the auctions are for and who are the parties should be. We look for, from the perspective of PBS implementation, we don't want to go too much um, complicated. So we just took a um, mostly take an ascending second price auction. So this, again, what we're trying to do here is what the market is doing now and give them the same thing, more or less, but give some fairness, right? And make the decentralization more. So currently the, the proposers or the validators are using these relays because they want more revenue. Simple as that. There's nothing wrong in it. The fees, they want it more. Um, you know, Lansky from Dapnord was saying that there's only six blocks, current stake concentration. So if it's get bigger and bigger, that will come down, so they will get lesser blocks. So they, they're not sure how much revenue they're gonna make it, so they, will, they want whatever they can get the bigger revenue. So the ME boost is a really good way to go. So we wanna keep that max revenue strategy for the validators that will actually increase the social welfare from an auction strategy, right? If you put together all the proposers in a pool, that's called a, um, in an Ethereum vocabulary we call this an MEB smoothening pool, but it's, Payout pool is not just a vanilla smoothening pool. It is much more than that. So I don't want to just degrade it as an MEV. So let's look at the auction. The auction works like this way. The bidders, um, you know, the, the bidders are bidding for a 12 second window and all the auctions goes in and every bidder or the builder here are the bidders. They have a private valuation for their auction. So they are not going to overbid or underbid, the caveat. There are presentations is that fees, you see the fees that the validators are collecting is more, the, the, bidder, the builders are offering more than what the fees should normally. There's a problem with this because that's distortion of actual, the private valuation representation, that's where the problem is. There's a lot of distortions now there. EIP-1559 fees is not the valuation of a builder. So the bidder should compete in an auction, right? Everyone has their own private valuation. What does that mean? How much I'm gonna make it money? So if I'm proposing a block, I have nine ETH, that that's the maximum revenue I'm gonna make it. I'm not gonna bid more than that. I'm not gonna, uh, it will keep under it. That's the rational theory around this bidding, right? Um, so ascending second price auction, we'll take that, 12 seconds, um, they can do two bids per relayer. So you can, our strategy here is 
maximum number of relayers, maximum number of bidders. So they will bid, and then you know the relayer will take the first price auction will start, kick off, you can just go up and up and up. There's a cutoff window, we'll get into that details in a later. And the build the builder can do two per relayer. They can go multiple directions. Um, and the highest bid will be selected. The proposer will see that through the MEB boost and they will just take the, the maximum price if they want to and then they will, they will sign that transactions. So the builders have a couple of things different here in this BBS implementation. The strategy is only known to them. When the blocks are getting published, it's public, but the strategy is known only to them. Currently, it's relayers known. You have to go to the relayer, you have to tell them everything I have, you know, and then they'll say, yeah, okay, fine. I don't, I can only, you know, I don't know how to read, I only know to write. That's, that's the way the relayer says. I can't do anything, I can only see things, you know, I'm really good. It's great. Great narrative. But here they can't see it because you have it. You can have the, so it's it's in it's in a good situation for the builders can get more and better employ better strategies and they can they can have more builder um, block building strategies to come in. So we want to empower them that way. And the proposer pool will get the in guarantee of the payment from the RPBS scheme that we mentioned. None of the bid will get qualified by the relayer if there is no payload of the proof has been submitted along with the bid. So it will get rejected. So that's how it works. So the proposer will get a commitment from the relayer and the guarantee of the payment, and they will sign it off, and this is how the, the bids are currently done. The relayer knows from a, a list of the builder's address from a registry, and similarly, the proposer also registered with a registry contract. So the PBS have three registries, builder registry, proposer registry, reporter registry. And then there is another contract where we basically own both the relayers. That's not a registry, but just an append list. So these are the three registries get synced. So the builders knows the proposer are in the PBS, so they can actually know that I want slot number one, I'm bidding for it, that's the proposer address, BLS key, I'm going for it, the relayer knows it, the proposer is already in the list, so that will get actually get qualified. And this is how it is getting the, the bidding, things are happening, but the, the PBS make sure this credible commitment from the proposer, they will not cheat. If they cheat, like I get some bid, I'm not gonna sign it, they are, the first rule of the PBS is every proposer in the proposal registry must come at their bandwidth to the pool, they cannot, say, no, I will not sign it. They should pay to the pool so that that's, there's a credible commitment scheme. That something came from the Pepsi model, Barnabé has done, so there's a lot of cocktail here because we're trying to say that the five months of work, we're trying to speed run many things, okay? So that's being said. All right, so why the proposer should join the pool, that's a question that I asked in the previous slides, right? What's the incentive? How do we get this incentive alignment? So, the way it works, the PBS payout pool, anyone can join the PBS pool as a validator. They can just join with the SDK, they can, you know, if a normal home staker, just use our DAP, or use the SDK and just drag and drop it, and you're all set, you're good to go. Then, ME boost construction, you don't really have to change anything, you just go and come and register with this, with your ECDC address, right? So how do the validator get paid? They get paid every week, better than your payroll, right? So it's, it's a weekly payment in ETH, that's nice. That will actually get them into the pool so more and more people can come. That's a consistent MEV payout regardless they were proposing a block or not. So it's a pool payment. So if they are part of the pool, they can collect it on every seven days and it's open for all. Every validator currently in the network, let it be LST networks, let it be stake pools, let it be home stakers, let it be big guys, everyone can be in the pool and everyone can take this, right? There's nothing stopping them to do it. So that's the incentive for the, the, the validators to join this pool. Right, so there's a bit of a block swap thing. We don't do anything which will take more than 60 seconds. 
a user has to, we need only the user attention for 60 seconds. And we also segregate their experience, right? We talked about this in earlier. So same thing apply here, because we are doing this for solo staker friendly. We want the noobs to get in. They want to go through this. So it's, this is the DAP. This is like you have proposal, reporter, builder, registration. You can do this with SDK if you're really good guys, that's fine. But this is for the new guys, right? So this is how you drag and drop your BLS public key. And um, sorry, key store, not the public key. That's, that's, that's wrong. And then you just sign it and you prove it that you're actually the validator. And that's, that's how you get registered. And there's no EIP pre-compiled for the BLS, to be told. But we know how to do this because that's what we've done for the steakhouse, that's why we're doing it. So don't try to do it. Can't be done with EIP, without, with, with, there's no pre compile So that's the registry contracts is doing it. So something that's helped from our last, you know, couple of years of work. Again, we are proof of stake fanboy, so we cannot just sit there and watch out, or well, that's getting fractured. Right, so once you are a member as a node runner, you can have thousands of validators, right? You're running a machine. And normally, in the industry, it's like you might be given your validator to someone, so it's, it's kind of be your servicing company. So this is the dashboard. You can add it. You can remove it. Rage good is always there in our protocols, similarly to this. You can exit any time, 24-7. Nobody's stopping you. So that's the, the visual hook. So how the PON, PBS, and the block building actually happening. So you have this kind of dotted line. That's where all the builder part, right? The builders will get their blocks or transactions from a user, like the vanilla you know, transactions through wallets or other things, and also from searches, the, the extra bounty packets, and they will make an inclusion list, which is the list of the, the blocks they want to do it, but they will not show the entire blocks, but they will give the inclusion list with the block header in a format that we give, and with the bit proof, that's another additional payload. And the relayers, they will transmit to the relayers for the as desired proposal they want to, but currently it's only for one slot. You cannot do two slot because of constraints with the, the, how the consensus layer works. Um, so the older bit should be done for slot by slot basis. You can make the block and you can wait for it, no problem. And the, from the proposer side, they don't do anything different from what they're doing. So that's where we are mostly focused on. We need to make sure whatever we're proposing in the short term should go with what is there. So they don't have to change it. So it's more of a UX, it's more of like to, to test it and it's, would it work or not. So the proposal will run the MEV boost, they will get it. Cool. So what does the supply chain look like when the PBS comes in? The supply chain looks like it's pretty different from what the supply chain's diagram that you will see other places. You have the payout pool on the top and the reporters, but then, then you have um, programmability because there's an on-chain credible commitment scheme. You can now coordinate further with protocols, with DAO sequencers or any other things. Would love to see these payment strategies and getting more broader scope for the builders to go out and get the, the money from the protocols or the users and other you know, supply chain actors in the, in the loop. So this will actually bring a lot of programmability before the builder um, is proposing or maybe they can combine it with the payout pool itself, like a gas tokens and things like that. It's pretty easy to build because you have this on-chain settlement and you can do it. So you don't really have to, we're not talking about anything of a relayer here, right? Relayers, but the relayers is very small. They should have some incentive. The payout pool pay for that, the maintenance fund, which came from our user actually. A user from a Discord said like they're paying a lot of money and there's, no, there's an egalitarian reason. So there's a maintenance fund, they can actually collect it being part of it. So this is how the supply chain looks like. I'm trying to abstract away a lot of details because it's, it's already thick. I don't really want to get you guys into sleep. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Jump. All right, so that's what we supply chain, but I wanna get Vincent back in and say how this is actually gonna get multi-dimensional. You wanna come in? Right. 
so right okay um the question is whether you know the the proposers uh, should only be dealing with 11 relayers and builders actually because it's that it's both right there's um you you can almost count on your hands uh uh, how many the, there are in the system? <clears throat> so, if the relays are just um, if the relays are just uh, implementing, uh, sorry, if the relays in our construction are only relaying in for uh, uh, bids, not not uh, making decisions, not uh, uh, inspecting any transactions because they will not see it. They um, uh, the, the the transactions are always sat with the builder, uh, never revealed uh, until until they have a, a signature over a block header, a uh, consensus layer block header. Then they will reveal that to the chain um, because they don't want to give up their um, their revenue. So, okay, what we want to do is uh, say that uh, a proposer can talk to n number of relays, um, and um, at, at, because at the end of the day, uh, all it, all it boils down to for a proposer is who's going to give me the, the highest bid, um, and they will sign that that one bid over. Um, they'll sign over the consensus layer block header. If they sign over more than one block header, good luck. Um, so what we can do is we can offer uh, a relayer with a default strategy, and, um, and 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 give that as an open source software for people to customize as they wish. So multiple uh, strategies ac across multiple relayers can exist. Not so. Uh, at the relay level, um, that'll be you know. So, for example, the uh, the second price auction that uh, uh, Matt uh, spoke about is is um, okay. So, um, if you look at a consensus layer block, everything needs to happen in a twelve second period. Um, now, if you remove uh, all of the PPS, uh, it's more than enough time for a, a proposer to build a block locally. They have a get uh, uh, they have a client. They will build the block, propose it to the chain. There's more than enough time to allow for that, even in the worst network conditions in, in, in any distributed net, uh, computing system. Um, but here, when you're doing um, proposal builder separation, there is a coordination game uh, that needs to take place. Um, you, and you know, if you're familiar with the price of anarchy rule, you know, we're using these coordination games. Um, and it has to happen in a, in a, in a, defined, a well-defined time period. So in a 12-second uh, period, you need to really segment things really clearly. Who does what in what, uh, in what segment? So the first two seconds uh, will be for, uh, in the default relay strategy that we'll offer, will be everyone submit your bids. Uh, and every builder gets two bids. And so they'll submit, uh, most likely they'll submit the first bid in the first two seconds. And then after the, 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 the first two seconds, there will be 0.8 um, seconds for somebody to come in with a crazy bid. There's one, one more bid that can be submitted. Um, if that goes through, fantastic. And the rest of the time is associated with a proposer making a decision, signing off, it goes back to the, uh, the builder to do the broadcasting on the execution layer, the consensus layer, the proposer does some, some revealing, um, and then everything wraps up in a 12 second period. But um, the, these strategies can be customized, so builders can produce their own strategies. Um, they can uh, fork the, uh, the builder software, relays can fork the relay software, and uh, a uh, so uh, a POM network will have one payout pool and uh, three registries uh, for, for, for the on-chain representation of, um, of, of, of uh, the actors in the system. But every uh, PON system only has one power pool. Everybody is coordinating around this pool. But you can have as many relays as you want serving the payout pool. So it can produce really interesting strategies. Now, we have this guy, the reporters in the system, which we've not talked about too much yet. So um, everything centers around this payout pool. Now, in, an, in a, in a well-functioning um, PBS PON system, builders are bidding for block space. Um, proposers are accepting that. When the, uh, when the uh, block gets appended on the execution layer and the consensus layer, there will be a payment from the builder into the payout pool. And that will get distributed pro rata to 
all the registered proposers in the payout pool. Okay, that's how it, if everything is happy, everything is perfect, uh, you know, nobody is violating any rules. So we have a set of uh, rules that must be follow, uh, followed. And it, it boils down to essentially builder not grieving, proposer, proposer not, you know, it, it, it falls into those categories. Now, the, uh, the, the reporter is the guy that is looking at um, builders, uh, relayers, proposers, and looking for, um, looking for faults. Um, in uh, violations of the, of the PBS rules that we define. There's about seven categories of violations, um, you know, and, and, and one of them is uh, build a, um, build a, a, a specified, uh, a promised amount for a block. Let's say it's two ETH. And um, it comes to the proposer signs off the consensus layer a block header. Block goes through. Oh dear, we look at the payout pool because that is the on-chain settlement where you can reconcile everything. It's out in the open. You look at the payout pool and the builder paid nothing. Ooh, oh dear. During this negotiation, this encrypted negotiation um, between the builder and the proposer, they will have had to have in interacted with a relayer. So a relayer that's registered and known in the system. So they make a, they, they make a bit and attach an RPBS payload, which is a, um, so it, RPBS is, stands for Restricted Partially Blind Signatures. So what it does is it allows you to ask somebody to sign a piece of information where some of the information is revealed, some of the information is not. So what you can do is you can blind the block information. You can say, hey, Relay, I want to bid for, I want to bid for um, in, this block to be included into the chain. I'm going to blind the, 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 the transaction list of which the last payment in the block, uh, sorry, the last transaction in the block must be a payment to the payout pool. Um, so the, 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 the signer cannot see this, but in the public part, they will put the bid, proof of, you know, proof of payment that they, that they have included that last transaction in the list, and they will say, can I make this bid? And um, according to the second price auction, you know, as long as you've done it in the first two seconds, or it's, uh, it's up to the 2.8 second, you do the final highest bid, uh, as long as you're, you're the highest bid, and it will say, yep, yep, you can go and do that. As long as the proposer also signs off on this, you can go ahead and do it. So, if going back to the violation that I spoke about, Builder said, hey, I'm going to give you money, and then I, I, I don't give you money, because you can see in the payout pool that that didn't happen, um, well, the reporter can reconcile that with the, the, the relayer and the smart contract, and it can say you've done a violation slash the builder. So the penalty, so the, 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 pay, um, the reporter is going to get some fee for doing that in ether. So it's not um, this in protocol PBS, it just deals with ether. Um, proposers register payout pool, get paid ether every seven days. Reporters who are keeping the, um, the system in check, they're getting paid in ETH. There's no token to shill here, other than if you like ETH, run a reporter. Um, the, it, it works as follows. There's, there's, there's different, so once you find, as a reporter, once you find there's a PBS violation, there is um, a, a bounty that will be awarded. In this case, as a builder, if you have an, an amount you promised, you promised two ETH for a block, the penalty is four ETH. Now, where does that, that money come from? Well, if you, uh, uh, at the start of this talk, we spoke about when, as a builder, when you want to register in the builder registry, you must put collateral at stake for if you perform a violation. So let's say your builder stake is 10 ETH. Um, there's a minimum amount, and it's, and it's calculated on the basis of um, average execution layer rewards. Uh, there will be documentation on, on this about where the minimum amount comes from, and then over time, the contract averages the last 100 payouts, and that's the minimum amount that all builders must stake in order to be, to comply, to be compliant with the system, because if they misbehave, they are, they are the result of a, a financial loss to the proposers who are working for the, 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 the payout pool. So the, the payout pool demands that when, when you register as your proposer to the payout pool, you must commit your block space to the payout pool. You must always sign a block header. You cannot say, no, I'm gonna build a block locally because of whatever reason. So the, the protocol demands that you commit your, your, your capacity. You can leave every time, so you can rage quit and you can say, I don't wanna be part of PON anymore. So that's, that's your out if you want to go different, uh, different routes. 
That's not a problem. But when you're registered, you must commit your payment. Um, and when a builder doesn't pay, that is a financial loss to, to these guys who, who said, I'm going to definitely commit my, my, my uh, capacity to you. And the reporter keeps that in check. So this guy is making, looking out, making sure uh, that things are in order, and um, they stand to benefit from that. Pretty simple. This is um, a diagram of, of really how the payout pool is working. Um, it describes the inflows into the payout pool. So typically speaking, that's um, builders paying proposer. That's the main inflow. The other inflow is um, reporters slashing builders in the builder registry. So they put amount at stake and they did some violation. So the, um, uh, the, the, the stake of a builder is slashed and the payout pool is compensated for that. Fair. It's pretty fair. They promised to do something. They didn't do it. Outflows are either to, okay, so there's two outflows. One is just uh, payments every seven days to proposers for being part of the payout pool. You don't have to have produced the block. You just have that commitment that you will um, uh, commit your bandwidth to the payout pool if you are selected by the Randall to, uh, pr uh, to propose a block. And um, when, it, when it comes to the proposer um, grieving the system, they are the ones that are going to be penalized by the reporters. So, reporters can be uh, paid for penalties. So, what happens is, at a high level, uh, based on the penalty calculation, a proposer who violated the PBS rules will get, will get slashed. So, so, proposers don't have to put up a bond in order to be part of the payout pool, but they will earn money every, seven, uh, every cycle, which is a seven-day cycle. Um, they're reportable in a cycle window. So that's where the seven day comes from. You get paid every seven days as long as you don't do a violation. In between that, in between uh, each seven day cycle, if you did some violation, you will be caught by the, uh, by the reporters. And um, the, um, the, the reporters are paid on the basis of what a proposer has earned. Um, they will get a cut of that. And um, it, it's not just the, um, the proposers, sorry, the reporter that's being paid when a a violation is, is, um, is committed, the other proposers are in the pool are also affected because everybody's, you know, everybody's contributing and doing work, committing their bandwidth to the payout pool, and one guy is not doing the work. That's unfair, right? Everybody's you know, supposed to be a, you know, a team. So a proposer that violated uh, the rules, they get penalized. 50% of the penalty goes to the other proposers in the payout pool. So N minus one proposers that are registered. They get paid, and then 50% of the penalty goes to the reporter for finding the violation. This is, you can think of this as the, um, in the consensus layer, they have this whistleblowing. You know, if, um, if a proposer double signs a block, there will be some whistleblower that will sound the alarm. Same thing here. I'll, I'll uh, leave the rest to Matt. Yeah, I'm not going to say more, because... I can tell people are digesting information. <laughs> so that's a lot, many things that we talked. But it's important takeaways like why we're doing it and what we're doing it. It's, as I said from the beginning, this is not a commercial endeavor that we have. We took this approach because we have to do this. And we hit the wall many times. Um, it just like we are on the fire for the last five months, we, we, we got through this. And, of course, with the help of our partners, um, there is a lot of documentation and everything that we discussed. But if you just, just take a look at the state of play currently, the builders and relayers, they are very small in number, right? This Ethereum is a dream, is a network, is a value that we should protect. We need to keep this credibly neutral. And that's why we are working on this. Um, we want everyone's feedback. Uh, all we are focusing now is how do we get more builders coming into the ecosystem and more relayers coming into the ecosystem. Um, the current scenario is very unfortunate. It's just an accident. It's not really like made up in any, any, any corporate firms. Um, everyone is doing their bit, a lot of research is happening. We believe incentivizing actors, getting something in, in, in protocol commitment on smart contract driven. There are two, the surface area is very broad. So what we took the approach is um, 
getting stricter rules around the contracts from the payout pool and make sure there's a, enough bandwidth, enough incentive to join new proposers. If there is not enough new, the liquid staking networks will facilitate that. You know, we have only 15%. We can get to 50%, 60% network of stake, um, you know, and we will get more and more bandwidth there. Um, we'll grow. Uh, but it is, it is worth to take a note that we have to do something on this one. Um, having said that, what we want to do is like truly democratize the supply chain, make the relayer super lean and simple, do what they're supposed to do, and get them out of the hook, right? They're not seeing anything. They can operate in US, you can operate in UK, you can operate in any other jurisdiction. You are just doing your job, right? You're not doing other things. Um, the thing it is, currently, relayer software is, um, a lot, a lot of good people actually worked on putting together that piece. Um, I mean, really good people. They have um, great, great talent. But it's, it's, it's an open ecosystem. We just need more and more innovation to come in. And we want to make that layer much more simpler. So we want to help each other. So we want to make that layer to be very simple. And we want to have like hundreds of or thousands of tens of thousands of relayers to be there. So transactions can go through it. At the same time, we want to get this kind of builder ecosystem to grow in a decentralized manner. And the other supply chain actors should also find a route to them and to, to incentivize with the account abstractions coming in, 4844 coming in. There are a lot of things we can do to build a supply chain more composable, more decentralized, more programmable, and more inclusive. That's very important, more inclusive. And, and fair and also serving the user. Um, and we need to start somewhere here so we can get more um, builders into the ecosystem. So we want to empower them to. And most importantly, we want to remove this fear of payment loss from the proposer. That's one of the biggest barrier. If you go to the proposer, I don't know I will get a block. I'm not a guy who knows how to make the block building. I'll get like six or seven, you know, seven maximum currently. So we want to remove that fear and we want to incentivize them to come together. And we will see that a, an instance, a POI instance means a, an off-chain relayer and then a PBS complete, right? So it's a two dual factor disk. And you can have multiple instances that one. We're going to release all the documentations. We're going to release all the softwares in the coming days. It's ready. So where we are at that now is like if you want to build this kind of decentralized collective, we need your help. We need everyone's help. We are reaching out to everyone. A lot of people helped us throughout this way. If you're a relayer, if you're a builder, if you're a validator collective, so you're staking pools, we are here. We're ready to talk. You know, we can give all the things that we did. We are, we're ready to hear your information. Um, you know, tweak this. We are launching a test net with a dApp and everything, possibly by next week. We're completely slammed with a lot of stuff, so we're just, just prepping all that thing, you know, once we're back home. So next week, possibly, we can get that out and go early. So test it out, add the validators, you know, give us the feedback if anything needs to be changed. And we can get the version one out. We have done the formal audit. So we have done a formal off-chain model and an on-chain contract audit that has been completed. It's going on the, the final things. Um, we also done the, the RPBS module, the cryptographic module audit that's completed. We have, um, you know, there's an ongoing thing about the game theory part, like the, the default strategy part and the PON model that is also getting formally verified from the game theory perspective. So we can get it secured that model as well. We can get more, you know, correctness to what we're doing. We know what we're doing, right? So we are reaching out to everyone. Um, we need your help. We did some work. It's not perfect, not in any other way. I can say that. It's only five months. But we are getting the cat out of the bag. You know, please use it. Please, you know, stress test it and give us a feedback and let's go together and uh, get back to, to the sanity and claim the credible neutrality of Ethereum forever. We're just doing our bit, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming in.